Rescue me, O Lord, from evil men. Protect me from men of violence who devise evil plans in their hearts and stir up war every day. They make their tongues as sharp as a serpent's. The poison of vipers is on their lips, Shelah. Keep me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked. Protect me from men of violence who plan to trip my feet. Proud men have hidden a snare for me. They have spread out the cords of their net and have set traps for me along my path, Shelah. O Lord, I say to you, you are my God. Hear, O Lord, my cry for mercy. O sovereign Lord, my strong deliverer, who shields my head in the day of battle. Do not grant the wicked their desires, O Lord. Do not let their plans succeed, or they will become proud, Shelah. Let the heads of those who surround me be covered with the trouble that their lips have caused. Let burning coals fall upon them. May they be thrown into the fire, into the miry pits, never to rise. Let slanderers not be established in the land. May disaster hunt down men of violence. I know that the Lord secures justice for the poor and upholds the cause of the needy. Surely the righteous will praise your name and the upright will live before you. Amen. Let's pray, please. Father, thank you for this, your holy word, and thank you for this message and these people who are here to receive it. I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit, Lord, would anoint us all, that, Lord, what we do and say here would be pleasing to you, that truly, Lord, we would see what you would have us to see, to hear what you would have us to hear, and that, Lord, we would draw near to you through this message. Lord, please, we want to accomplish your good and perfect will. We want to please you. For it is in your name, Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God's presence. The last verse there. Surely the righteous will praise your name and the upright will live before you. Many translations says live in your presence. This is a prayer. This is a prayer by David for deliverance from his enemies. Now David's prayer was one of a trust in God and he, that God has the power and the strength to protect his people, his loved ones, to protect his loved ones from suffering and pain. David always had enemies because the enemy of his soul was always out to get him. These enemies at time would lay snares and traps with the intention of destroying David. And I want you to know something, brothers and sisters, we have the very same enemy. We call him Satan. He is that great serpent of old. And Satan will try to lay snares and traps for us. But we must be watching, watching for these stumbling blocks that he places in front of us because he wants us spiritually to stumble and fall. David's enemies would imagine troubles in their hearts and they would continually be gathered for war. They would never let up. It seems like he didn't have any peace because his enemy was always after him. Satan and his demons are out and they are continually warring against you and me. They want our souls. Those of us that's given our souls to God, hallelujah, he can't have them. Satan can't have them. But he can keep us from helping others come to the Lord. This psalm is really about God's power and promise to protect us from harm and keep us from violence. And David's defense was God, just like he is our defense too. Verse 13 of our text says, again, I'll say it, surely the righteous will what? Praise your name. And the upright will live in your presence or they will live before you. Hallelujah. The presence of God is something that we should never ever take lightly. In fact, most of us don't even think about the presence of God, but he's always with us. Where can we go where God does not see us? Where can we go where God can't find us? I don't care how dark it is. I don't care if you go into the cave, you hide in your closet, you say in your spirit, nobody will ever know you're a fool because God knows everything. 
God knows everything. Where can we go? The presence of God we should always take very seriously. The idea, though, that a pure, holy, perfect God would ever even choose to associate himself with us, sinful people as we are, seems to be a contradiction, doesn't it? Doesn't it seem strange that God being so holy and so righteous and we being such sinners, and yet he's with us, he watches us. If it were not for the redeeming work of Jesus Christ, God's Son, we could never hope. We could never hope to experience God's presence and fellowship and therefore His protection. But God Himself has made the way through His Son, Jesus. The Apostle Paul was speaking of this very thing when he said in Ephesians 2, 13, he says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of of Christ hallelujah then Paul went on to say in Ephesians 2 18 he says for the through him Jesus we both have access to the father by one spirit hallelujah the bottom line here is simply that if the child of God is not enjoying the presence of God it's not because God doesn't desire to be with you it's because you refuse him he's made every provision in his son Jesus that men all mankind all women can come to him through Jesus it is the characteristics of God's presence that I want us to think a little bit about this morning I want to thank God that I've had the privilege in my life to experience some, I would say, extraordinary moves of God. It's hard to explain some of the things that I have seen God do in my life. It's hard to explain some of the events that I have witnessed, experienced firsthand and seen God move in such a way that you almost have to be there. You have to feel it. You have to see it. God moved so greatly that some of these places that I have seen that it was so obvious to everyone that it was God that was doing it. It was during these times that I became very aware of the characteristics of God's presence, and I'd like to share some of those with you today. First, God's presence is very powerful. It's very powerful. God's presence is so imposing in its form that when he comes in power, you cannot resist and you can't hide. 1 Chronicles 16, 27 says, Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his presence. Maybe images of the Shekinah glory of God were fresh on the mind of David when he wrote these words. When he wrote these words in the Psalms, maybe this Shekinah glory of God was very clear in his mind. I've been in worship services where the presence of God was so awesome and so imposing that it couldn't be anything but the presence of God. I've seen times when the presence of God brought such a solemn hush upon the people who were worshiping that it was almost you were afraid to breathe, that if you took a deep breath, that it was almost like you were insulting God because the stillness and the quietness was so deep, so pure, that you would go, you'd be afraid. At other times, the presence of God resulted in such conviction and such power that people were crying and yelling under conviction of the Holy Spirit. And the power of God was in them so bad that they couldn't be quiet. They were embarrassed. You could tell. They wanted to stop. They wanted to stop crying. They wanted to stop doing what they were doing, but they couldn't because they were under the control of God. I've done some things that's pretty embarrassing when God grabs a hold of me 
and I'm under his power. Because the presence of God is so imposing, once he's got you, he's got you, and you can't stop it. It's very strong in his power. The real question, though, is this this morning, is are we really hungry? Do we really want the presence of God among us and in us? Do we really want it? I got to tell you, I know many people, they're pretty satisfied with what they have. They don't want anything stirring the pot. They don't want to be embarrassed like Pastor Lockwood. They, want to, they don't want to do anything embarrassing. They don't want to do something they may have, somebody may ask a question about later on, and I don't want to have to answer to that. And they're good with the way things are. Because the presence of God can really be very convicting at times, and a lot of people don't want to be convicted of who they really are and what they are. Because God's presence is very, very imposing. And his presence is imposing in the fact that there is a lot of fearfulness in it. Exodus 19, 16 says, On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the whole camp trembled. Now, I can only imagine how awesome and how fearful that sight must have been to the Israelites there on the desert looking up on the mountain and feeling the rumble and seeing the fire and the cloud and hearing it so loud that it was... Have you everybody been around a really big explosion? Those of you military guys, you know what I'm talking about. That explosion that happened a mile or two away and yet when that blast zone hits your body, what does it do to you? You can feel it go right through you. If you've never experienced it, then you don't know what I'm talking about. But those of you who have experienced it, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's like you tell the second it hits you and the second it goes out your back. I can imagine that's what the Israelites were experiencing before God. And he was pounding and pounding. And it frightened them. They were afraid. But you know, this sight impressed upon their minds the need of reverential awe toward Jehovah God. In other words, because they saw that and because they were afraid, they knew. They knew they had to humble themselves before God. Sometimes you and I, we need that knowledge. We need to know that. So much so, these people, they said it so much so that they requested that God, don't speak to us anymore, God. You speak to Moses. Speak to Moses. Don't speak to us. They were afraid. And some may fault the Israelites for their response to God's presence, but at least they didn't take it lightly, did they? And yet sometimes we take God's presence so lightly in our lives. In our day, we tend to be too much superficial, if you will, about the presence of God. Uh, I think the majority of Christians these days never even seem to consider the need to search their hearts even when they come to church. They pray to God that Christians our day would come to God. I, I pray, I pray that, that we would come before God in awe and in reverence. The psalmist said in Psalm 96, 9, he says, Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. You know, God is so good, so loving, so kind. He's been so kind to us that we tend to take him for granted. It's said, but I think it's very sad to me that, to suggest that many churches have really experienced very little of the presence of God. 
This is mainly due to the fact that we Christians often come to God's house with selfish motives instead of the proper motives before God. We come looking for a blessing, not looking for the blesser. You come because you want a blessing from God, not because you want to see God. We come looking for a gift rather than God. We, we come looking for help rather than God. Now, don't get me wrong. There's nothing particularly wrong with seeking God for these things. Because guess what? We all need blessings. We all need gifts. We all need help. But if that's what we're coming to church for, if that's what the only thing we're looking for, then we're not looking for the right thing. We look for God. We seek His face. And if He blesses us, hallelujah. And if He helps us, hallelujah. If He heals us, hallelujah. If He gives us everything we need, then hallelujah but we seek God and leave it up to God I have a suspicion that we'd be better off if we'd stop just seeking goodies from God's hand and start seeking his face God has a lot in his hand and he has a desire to give it to us but if that's all we're looking for, we're looking for the wrong things. We don't merely need what God can provide for us. We need God. We need His presence and we need His power. Tommy Tenney says that intimacy with God will bring about blessings. But the pursuit of blessings won't bring about intimacy with God. God is not coming to people who merely seek his benefits. He's coming to people who seek his face. God's presence is also imposing in its forcefulness. 2 Chronicles 5, 13-14 says... Then the temple of the Lord was filled with a cloud, and the priests could not perform their services because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the temple of God. What our churches need today is a good dose of the overwhelming presence of God. In the case just mentioned here, the presence of God took over and controlled the temple. The priests they were trying to conduct a service. They were in the middle of their service when the presence of God changed the order of service. All of a sudden, they couldn't do their service anymore because God took over. I wonder what would happen in many churches this morning if the awesome presence of God broke out in service. What if the presence of God was so strong that the preacher couldn't preach? Because so many people were crying under the conviction of their sins. Or what if people having to leave their seats because they were conviction so hard that they had to get up out of their seats and go to other people and ask for forgiveness because they knew they had said something or done something wrong against someone else and they were under such conviction that they had to get up and go tell them because they knew they wouldn't have peace until they went and said, please forgive me. Oh, it's truly wonderful when the presence of God actually directs a worship service. It may be different than what we're used to, but that's what we need. But don't miss, miss the prerequisites that are mentioned in 2 Chronicles 5. The presence of God came as a result of purging Preparation and praise. All three of those things we need if we want the presence of God. Number two is penetrating. The presence of God is penetrating. God said in 1 Samuel 16 7, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance. But God looks at the heart. Hallelujah. 
I, for one, am glad that God knows my heart. Because if all he knew is what I did, I would be in a lot of trouble. Because I know I'm weak and I know I'm a sinner and I know I fail God all the time. But God sees my heart. Psalm 44, 20 and 21 says, If we had forgotten the name of our God or spread out our hands to a foreign God, would God not have discovered it since he knows the secrets of our hearts? God's word tells us in Proverbs 15, 3, that the eyes of the Lord are on every place, beholding the evil and the good. How a person appears, he does not fool God in the least. Just how we appear to each other has nothing to do who we really are. God does not see us even as we perceive ourselves or even as we profess ourselves to be. God sees us as we really are. We can fool each other. Some of us are pretty good actors. But the truth is God sees us as who we really are. You may come into God's house today thinking that no one really knows what's going on in your life. And you know what? That may be true. Most of us don't know you. Most of us don't know what's going on in your life. But God does. God knows the truth about you before you even came to this church today. The presence of the Lord is penetrating. God looks deeper into us than anyone else, even ourselves. He looks more internal than external. Next, God is universal. His presence, God is everywhere. David said in Psalm 139, 7, he says, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? Then he goes on to say that God is everywhere. Jesus said that men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Any attempt on man's part to hide his evil conduct with a cloak of darkness or by any other means is totally futile. God doesn't miss anything. It doesn't matter how dark it is. It doesn't matter where we are. God sees everything and knows everything. Proverbs 15.3 says, The eyes of the Lord are everywhere, keeping watch on the wicked and the good. And one more scripture here. Hebrews 4.13 says, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. That's pretty specific and pretty clear, isn't it? God is everywhere and God sees everything. It's also... For some of you, I think the presence of the God is pleasant. First Chronicles 16, 27 says, Splendor and majesty are before him, strength and joy are in his dwelling place. Hallelujah. Where God lives, there is strength and joy. And Psalm 1611 says, You made known to me the path of your life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Now there's much more scripture that I could quote to you or read to you. But I think you get the point. God's, you know, going his way, going our way, sometimes may seem pleasurable and exciting when we go our own way. Sometimes it seems that that's the right way, but usually it's only for a short time. But for the Christian, Living outside of the will of God and living outside the presence of God is truly a miserable experience. If you should have any doubts, consider the case of King David, who for perhaps for maybe a year, he refused to repent and to confess his sin with Bathsheba. Remember? Only when the Holy Spirit, through the prophet Nathan exposed his heart that the king confess. He says, I have sinned against the Lord. You see, the Spirit worked through God's prophet. 
Psalms 32, 1 through 5, recounts the misery that King David endured up until he got right with God. He was suffering needlessly. Please turn in your Bibles to Psalm 32. Let's back up. If you, hopefully you have your Bibles still open. Let's turn to this. I want to read some here. 32, verses 1 through 5. Psalm 32, verses 1 through 5 says, Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer, Shelah. Then... I acknowledge my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin, Shelah. See, David was suffering. He was suffering and had no peace until he confessed his sins before the Lord. And God's presence is promised. He promised his presence to those who would call on him. His presence is with us all along life way. God said in Genesis 28, 15, he says, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land and I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised to you. Hallelujah. God's people can claim that promise. God said in Hebrews 13, 5, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. God's people can claim that promise too. Christians are God's people. Also, God's presence is with us in our worship. Jesus promised in Matthew 18, 20, he says, for, for two or three gather in my name, there am I. With them. Hallelujah. Oh, we like lots of numbers. I love it when I look out and I see lots of people in church. But you know, all it takes is one of you. Because I count as one. Hallelujah. And then one more. And guess what? God's with us when we worship him. And you know what? God's presence is also very valuable. It's last but not least. God's presence is so very valuable to all of us. David feared the loss of God's presence. He wrote in Psalm 5111, he says, Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Sin in our lives causes a sense of God's presence to fade away. When we're sinning, when we turn our back on God, even though he's still there, we don't know it, we don't accept it, and we reject God. When we sin, we grieve the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's with us. Those of us who belong to God, who have accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, but we still sin, and when we sin and we turn our back on God, we grieve God. We grieve the Holy Spirit. Isaiah 64, 7 says, For you have hidden your face from us and given us over to our sins. Those words should sadden God's people greatly. To hear from God that he's turning his back on us. That is not what I want God to do. I want God to to look directly at me and I want to look directly at him and I want to know his presence even though his presence is so powerful and so penetrating and so universal and so pleasant and so promised and so valuable I want it I am not worthy but God made me some promises in conclusion we need to let our faith and our trust in God grow and mature. God's presence is powerful. 
it is penetrating, it is universal, it is pleasant, it is promised, and yes, it is valuable. But we, in our faith, must desire it and chase after it and want it. God's provided it. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your...